I think we might make a start. I've got four sources of the time, one the clock up there, one the clock on here, one my mobile phone and the other my watch, and they're all showing different times, so that's not very helpful. So I think I'll just decree that it's one o'clock and we'll get underway, I think. Um, I should say, just by way of uh, introduction, that there will be a handout at the end of this, but it's not directly the lecture. I, I, I don't get on very well myself sort of reading a lecture out. Um, and uh, what I like to do here is to leave something that I've published which is relevant to the topic, uh, but won't be exactly the same as the lecture, although the lecture in this case two lectures because they're sort of intertwined, uh, will be reflected in the reading matter that if you care to, you can pick up at the end. Um, what I want to do in these two lectures is to um, sort of focus primarily on the idea of rights and what uh, religious social thought can make of the idea of rights and how uh, uh, theological ideas uh, relate to ideas of rights. Um, and this is all part of the whole sort of trajectory of what I've been trying to do over the two and a half years that I've been giving these lectures. That is, what sort of understanding uh, of the role of religion in public affairs uh, what sort of role can be found for religion in those circumstances in a liberal democratic society which also possesses now a kind of basic uh, framework of rights through the Human Rights Act which incorporates the European Convention on Human Rights which was actually written by British civil servants in the post-war period. Um, and, um, the, uh, and the common law tradition. How far do these ideas of rights relate both to documents like the Human Rights Act, also the common law tradition? And then more recently, the Equalities Act, which uh, criminalises uh, discrimination against uh, people who, uh, 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 whose position is protected under what in the, uh, in the, um, the, the Act is called uh, uh, protected characteristics. So it's illegal to discriminate against people in terms of these protected characteristics, which include things like age, uh, gender, sexual orientation, religious belief, and so forth. So we do have a set of rules and rights through these various documents, the tradition of the common law, the European Convention and the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act, which defines the set of rights, which of course, as citizens, uh, religious people also possess, but they also have an extra kind of uh, protection because religion is one of those things that is, protect is a protected characteristic along with things like gender and so forth. So given that we've got this framework of rights, what are uh, religious people uh, to make about this and uh, to make of this? And I have to say that uh, the, the religion that I know that I'm a member of is Christianity. So I quite often refer more specifically to Christianity, but I think the issues that I want to raise will uh, impact on all uh, of the religious beliefs that are held uh, commonly in Western European societies and, and most particularly uh, Britain. So that's my way of preamble. What kind of accommodation can be made between religious belief and a set of basic rights? That's the issue I want to try to explore. And today I want to do it by looking at some of the, if you like, philosophical and moral issues and then the next time, which I think is the 25th, uh, I look at how some of these things play out in actual moral dilemmas of things like uh, euthanasia, which of course is going, the assisted dying bill is going through the House of Lords at the moment, uh, and how issues of rights relate to things of that sort. Uh, and I think you'll find uh, that a lot of the, if you like, philosophical questions are also mirrored 
in these practical ethical uh, disputes. Now, one quite useful place to start this sort of uh, uh, inquiry is to just unpack a little bit the idea of human rights. And after all, the Act of Parliament in Britain is the Human Rights Act. And so what, what do we mean by human rights? And, 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 and how, how do we understand how these human rights are somehow grounded? What's the foundation of human rights? Well, I mean, what, one of the obvious things, one of the obvious constraints on an answer to the question, uh, what are human rights and what is it that provides them with a justification, is to say, well, because these rights are the rights that people should have in virtue not of being a British citizen or an Irish citizen or a Bangladeshi citizen, but in virtue of their humanity, uh, that we have to, if, if, if there's a justification for human rights, it can't be a justification drawn from some very specific uh, moral point of view embedded in a particular society. Human rights are held in virtue of our humanity, which in turn differs from um, uh, the view of what it is to be a person held in different uh, uh, political and so social uh, systems and uh, nation states and so forth, that it's not the rights that you have as a citizen, but rather the rights that you have as a citizen should reflect basic universal human rights. So if we think that there are human rights of that sort, which are not just the rights of an English person or a Scottish person or a Bangladeshi, as I said, or anybody else, but rights that people have in virtue of their humanity, what, do we, what sense can we make of what is it that underpins this idea of human rights? Well, one way of approaching this has been to say, well, look, human dignity resides in um, human beings being different from the order of nature, if you like, that what gives human beings their dignity and worth is some kind of uh, characteristic, some kind of capacity, some kind of element of their nature, which is distinctive to them and can be a basis for rights. Now, of course, if that's the line you're taking, that, that human rights reflect human dignity, which in turn reflects something specific and um, specific and um, particular about um, human nature, which differs from, say, animals and so forth, if that's what you say, then you've got to grapple with the following question. What is the um, characteristic of human beings that makes them bearers of dignity and which, uh, and which dignity is to be protected by a claim to rights. So what we've got to do on this view is to identify that feature of human life which all human beings have in common because it's a universal right. And what, what might it be? What, what, what sort of notion of dignity could be held on a universal basis? Why, why is it that human beings have this uh, dignity and on the basis of, of what is it ascribed? And broadly speaking, and this is very broad, there are two answers to this question. One has been to stress, if you like, human rational capacities, that human beings are capable of deliberation, of thinking about their goals and purposes. They're not just creatures of desire or biological drives and so forth. They have the capacity to evaluate their own behavior. They can deliberate about what is the right and wrong thing to do and so on. And that that rational capacity, which so far as we know isn't shared by other animals, 
uh, that rational capacity is the foundation of human uh, dignity. And ultimately, that dignity turns on the idea that human beings can actually choose the ends which they wish to pursue, and they use their reason to think about the appropriate means for pursuing those ends. So on this view, what gives human beings dignity is the idea of autonomy, that we are not, as it were, the victims of uh, naturalistic forces in our nature of desire of, uh, of one sort or another, but rather that our na our, we can shape our own nature. And this, this idea is very much associated in the literature about human rights uh, with the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who flourished at the end of the 18th century. And for Kant, uh, what was really distinctive about human life was the capacity to deliberate, to choose, to commit yourself to a principle and follow it through, but also to revise that principle if it could be shown uh, not to work uh, to uh, other people's rights as well, that it had to be compatible with other people's rights. So for, for those who think in this way, human rights are grounded in human dignity and human dignity has to do with the capacity for reason and choice. And that's what makes human beings special. And rights should particularly protect individual choice. That, that's the idea. And the central moral commitment here is to the idea of autonomy. Now, this is, a, a, I'll come back to other issues to do with this, but just for the moment to say this, this is a, quite a big issue, uh, because if you think that autonomy is the thing that primarily gives human beings their dignity and worth, then this is an immediate challenge to many uh, religious points of view, so it might seem, uh, because um, after all, they might not recognize within a particular religion that human autonomy is all that special or important and indeed might ostensibly not give it any kind of particular regard or recognition at all. That what matters, let's say, from the point of view of some religious communities is to live your life uh, as one of discipleship of following the will of God and the, the uh, as we understand it through whatever the sacred texts of our religious belief might be. And the question of autonomy is really neither here nor there. Uh, that we, that what matters is that we live a life that is coherent with uh, and mandated by uh, the basic principles of our religious beliefs, which may be utterly indifferent to the idea of autonomy. So even to go as far as this about rights and say, well, with Kant, yes, rights are rooted in our, our capacity for autonomy, how can those rights be universal if there are large segments of humanity, adherence to one religious belief or another, that don't recognize autonomy as being fundamentally important? And, and, and may indeed regard autonomy, I mean, going back to the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, which was, you know, in a sense about human beings gaining autonomy, uh, that they may regard um, autonomy as almost uh, either irrelevant or sinful. So there's an immediate challenge to the question of how we ground rights. Now, there is an argument uh, about this, which is fairly straightforward um, and I think uh, compelling. And it's not mine, I hasten to add, it's by an American philosopher called, uh, called Alan G. Worth. And his argument is this, that however strict a religious belief might be in terms of what it requires you to do, however strict it is, 
there must be some space for autonomy in it. And this is based not on observation, but in a sense on logic, uh, Forgeworth. And his argument is this. Religions uh, require people to do various things. You ought to do this, you ought to do that. And because they recognise, if you like, uh, uh, to, to call it that, sin, because they recognise sin, that you ought not to do that and you ought not to do this kind of thing, that, that any religion is going to have ways of exhort exhorting people to follow the religion and ways of stigmatising those who don't. Now, what has to be true for it to be possible for people to need guidance about what they ought to do and what they ought not to do? Well, the answer to that is human beings have the capacity to choose between these things. And you cannot be, you can't make sense of the moral requirements of a religion, exhorting people to do this and stop doing that, unless you actually, at least implicitly, recognise that there is a space for autonomy and choice, even within the most sort of uh, disciplinary uh, forms of religion. There, there is always scope and room for autonomy. Now, what sort of particular um, weight you want to put on autonomy in that sense is, uh, is another matter. But you can't say, on Worth's argument, well, you know, this religion doesn't recognise autonomy because if it has a moral set of requirements to go with it, then it must recognise autonomy. Otherwise, it couldn't make sense of having those requirements in the first place. So I just want to put that down as a marker at the moment. You can't, that while the emphasis on autonomy as a basis for rights um, it is a challenge to some forms of religion, one of the arguments about why it's a, it is a sort of um, uh, compelling challenge is that those religions which might wish to downgrade or completely override the idea of autonomy still have to use it to make sense of their own uh, ideas about what you should and shouldn't do. But there is a completely different argument about the basis of rights, and it's this, um, that rights are not really to do with choice, not really to do with deliberation and the exercise of reason. And the reason for that, in the view of the critics I'm about to embark on, is this, that if you say that rights are rooted in or founded upon the capacity for autonomy, then what do you say about those who have never had the capacity for autonomy? Say, uh, that those who are born with uh, very severe mental uh, disorders or um, uh, you know, brain disabilities and so forth. What do you say about people who have had a severe stroke and are now in a persistent vegetative state uh, and uh, those who have basically been in a vegetative state for all or most of their lives. Because if you say you only have rights as an autonomous being, then does that mean that these people have, have no rights? They don't have rights because they don't have the appropriate capacity, namely autonomy, that grounds rights. And many people have argued, well, that is just too high a threshold for rights, because we wouldn't want to say, would we, that because people have got severe cerebral palsy or they've, got, uh, they've had a stroke or whatever, that they've somehow lost their rights. I mean, what's certain is that they either have never had or have lost their capacity for autonomy, but does that really mean that then they've lost the protection that rights affords? Well, yes, on a strict interpretation of this, because they no longer have the capacity that rights are there to protect. So there's that kind of problem. problem. 
And also, as critics of, 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 of a choice theory of rights also argue, is that it doesn't make sense of the rights of children. Children don't possess, I mean, they come, come to possess it if things go well, but they don't possess uh, the capacity for autonomy uh, in the appropriately understood way at the beginning of their lives. And again, does that mean that uh, children do not come to have rights until they learn how to exercise the capacity for autonomy? So there are these problems about rooting rights in choice, but it has to be said it's the most popular view about rights. You know, I defend my rights. Why? Well, because it protects my sphere of free choice, and you should not interfere with my rights, because doing that is to interfere with my freedom to choose. Now, if you are convinced by the idea that autonomy is the ground of rights, then this seems to follow. <coughs> but there is a different kind of line to take here, which is that because of these difficulties with rights and autonomy, we ought to think about um, rights being rooted in something rather different, namely <coughs> something like our basic needs or our basic interests as human beings. Um, and if you think about rights in that sense, that rights are there to protect your basic interests, uh, many of which might be best formulated as basic needs, if you say that, then it can accommodate the idea that one of your interests or one of your needs is the capacity for rational behaviour and rational deliberation and so on. But it goes far beyond that uh, because uh, we can recognise, for example, in the case of children, that if, if it's interests that uh, ground rights, then children should have these rights, which are denied under the choice theory, so the critic will say, that children can have these rights because they have interests even though they don't recognise those interests. And this isn't a, you know, some kind of obscure thought. I mean, it, it's perfectly feasible to think that even grown-ups have interests that they don't recognise. Um, and, I mean, for example, um, you know, I might have been uh, to the, uh, the chemist on the way here and bought some kind of tablets and then, you know, the pharmacist realises that he's given me the wrong thing and gets one of his staff to trail me down the road because it's not in my interest to consume that tablet, even though I'm completely unaware of the fact that it's not in my interest. There's a difference between having an interest and being interested in something. To be interested in something, you've got to be conscious, you've got to have thought about it, and you've got to have weighed one thing against another and so forth, to be interested in something. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a set of interests which it is perfectly feasible to think that you don't recognise. So we can say that children have a right to education because it's one of their basic interests even though they may not be remotely interested in education, but we can say they have a right to it because it's essential to their interests, which other people know better than they do. Now, of course, this is a very big shift from the choice theory of rights, because, after all, the choice theory is anti-paternalistic, if you like. Nobody can... In, uh, 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 Nobody should interfere with my rights which express my choices because that's, that, 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 that's incompatible with the idea of choice-based rights. Whereas on the interest theory of rights, you have a right because what is at stake is one of your basic interests, whether you know it or not. And the argument then is that 
if you go back to the criticism of the choice theory in terms of things like persistent vegetative state or a child not arriving at the uh, the, uh, the the the, um, the the development of the capacity for autonomy. If you go back to those, you can solve all those problems by invoking the idea of interests. That it's still in the interests of the child to be educated. It's still in the interest of the uh, person in a, a, a vegetative state to be fed and watered and so forth. Uh, and that what we need is some account of what our basic interests are, because an interest is what actually provides a basis uh, for rights. And it has, in some people's view, an advantage, and equally in other people's view, a major disadvantage, in that you could, using an interest theory of rights, uh, argue that animals have rights, because animals might be thought to have interests. They have an interest in not being brought and not not being tended and uh, dealt with in a uh, they have an interest in not 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 suffering cruelty uh, through through the way they are managed and so forth. Um, whereas on the choice theory of rights, because animals can't choose, they don't have rights. I mean that isn't a reason for treating them badly, but it just doesn't make sense to say that they have rights because they don't possess the capacity for choice. Whereas if you take the interest-based view of rights, then it's perfectly feasible to think that animals have rights because they have interests in not being dealt with in a cruel or exploitative way or something like that. Now, in the view of some people, that's a great advantage of the interest theory of rights. In the view of other people, uh, it, it shows why the interest theory of rights is wrong if it allows for rights to animals. Now, the, the, in Western sort of social and political thought, these are the two dominant approaches to ideas about rights, the choice theory and interest theory of rights. So well, how does all that fit in with a religious uh, point of view? The, what, well, uh, sorry, I'm just finding the, try, trying to find the best words. One issue here is, as I said right at the beginning, is that if we're talking about human rights as opposed to the rights that I have as a British citizen or whatever, we're talking about human rights, then these are rights that it must make sense to ascribe to anyone wherever they are and under whatever circumstances uh, they're living. They are uh, basic rights rooted in an idea of human dignity which in turn is rooted in either a recognition of the role of choice and deliberation in human life or in terms of interests. So, if we are saying that human rights are part of a universal ethic, if you like, which transcends more local forms of moral commitments, whether founded in secular moralities or in religious moralities, if you say that these things are universal, then why, why does it have to be uh, that, the, the, that uh, the question of, well, what are these rights, turns on whether it's the choice theory or the interest theory? Couldn't it be something else? And if so, what might it be? Well, one way of trying to think about this, about what is it that provides the undergirding of human rights, one way of trying to think about this is to say that any feature of human life that we might think of as underpinning rights has to be A, universal, because rights are universal, and B, morally relevant. And any answer to the question of what is it that grounds human rights has to be morally relevant and it has to be universal. Now, if you say that's a basic constraint on the answer to the question, what is it that grounds rights, 
then um, you, you've got a, a much smaller range of options, I think, to about an answer to the question of what is it that grounds rights. You can't just pick out some distinctive feature of human life and say, because of that, we have rights, unless whatever this feature is, is of some moral relevance. The uh, philosopher, German philosopher Hegel uh, satirized this, uh, uh, this in a way in one of his writings, and, and it, he did so in the following way. It's quite a telling way. Uh, we all have, as human beings, we all have earlobes. And uh, animals don't have earlobes, or at least Hegel in 1812 or something didn't think they had earlobes. So you might say what's distinctive about human life is that we have earlobes. Well, it might well be. I mean, it might be that everybody has earlobes. But that cannot possibly provide a basis for thinking that we have rights. I mean, we have no, no idea of what earlobes could possibly have to do with our sort of moral existence, as it were. I mean, it might, you never know these days. We, uh, you know, somebody might come up with uh, an account of that, in which case Hegel will be proved wrong. But that Hegel's point is that any feature that we regard as being central to our lives that can possibly ground rights has to have some kind of moral relevance. So when we survey the idea of what it is to be human, we have to pick as our distinctive basis for human dignity, we have to pick something that is morally uh, relevant. And this is why the terrain has narrowed really to that of choice on the one hand and interest on the other hand. The advantage of the interest theory of rights is that it can accommodate the choice theory of rights, but not the other way around. It can accommodate the choice theory because one of my basic interests is, if you like, the protection of my capacity to choose. But that isn't all there is to rights on the interest view. There are lots of other things as well. And of course, in terms of the relation of the, all this to uh, religious belief, there's quite a controversy about this um, amongst theologians because a good deal of religious belief, at least rooted in its, the sacred texts of various religions, is the, 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 the special nature of a particular community in the eyes of God. On, 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 on these uh, religious views. And this is perhaps particularly true of Judaism, if we take that as an example, um, because th there's a kind of specificity, if you like, about that kind of religious belief and the universality of human rights. And some have argued that the that, the, that, the, that what gives human beings status and dignity in a religious view that thinks there is a connection between the community of which they're a member and God, what, what gives that um, some kind of force is that our dignity is derived from being the child of God but made in the image of God, or whatever you might, however you might want to describe this. But if it's an image that is given by God in a particular religious community, through the idea, for example, of covenant, then how far can that support the idea of universal rights? I mean, if I'm not putting this very well, dignity. Human dignity is the basis for human rights and dignity on the views we've been looking, looking at to do with either choice or interests. 
But what about a religious belief that holds that dignity is a God-given feature, and it's a God-given feature in the context of a very specific religious revelation, let's say, for perhaps for want of a better word. So, I mean, uh, ju just to pursue that uh, for another sentence or two, if you think that um, there is a special covenant between God and the people of Israel, and that that, that covenant confers dignity given by God, how does that covenantal relationship, which is bounded by the religious belief, how does that relationship fit with the idea of there being a set of universal values which we, we cannot understand necessarily, because not all of us hold the same religious beliefs, we can't necessarily understand those universal values as being sanctioned by or legitimized by a particular kind of religious belief. So the problem is the universality of human rights can run up against the specificity, if you like, of a religious community. And I, I, I use Judaism as an example, but it would apply uh, to you know many many different forms of uh, Anglican uh, sorry not Anglican of uh, uh, Christian worship. It would also apply to Islam um, and the way in which the understanding of God is rooted in and indeed in conflict with within the the one religion uh, with, with you know the different branch, branches of Islam Sunni Shia uh, Salafic and so forth so. The, 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 there is an immediate problem with the idea of human rights which seems to override or is difficult to reconcile to highly specific kinds of religious understanding of what human dignity consists in. That's one of the issues. The second issue, I think, that, we, that, that has to be sort of addressed, really, in this context is that um, excuse me a is, is how far we want the idea of human rights to extend, because this again brings in questions about religious communities of one sort or another. How far do we want those rights to extend? Because many theologians have argued that if you have a social morality built entirely on the idea of rights, then this is going to actually deform a good deal of social life. Because there are many, many relationships, many, many institutional forms and so forth that can't possibly be understood in terms of rights. Certainly not rights of the choice variety um, because, after all, what this choice em embodies, as I have argued already, is the idea of individual autonomy. And what the vision, if you like, of the choice theory of rights offers is a society within which individuals will be empowered to express their autonomy, will be able to utilise the legal framework of rights and so forth to pursue their own sort of self-determination, if you want to put it that way. Now, if, if society is like that in terms of its basic social morality, how does that relate to what you're going to find in that society, obviously, namely a range of other views, and in particular religious views, which, as I've already said, may not be very hospitable to the idea of autonomy and self-determination, preferring something like a life of religious discipleship to one of Nietzsche, a kind of Nietzschean self-assertion. 
And there are many people who argue that an emphasis on rights will just fundamentally change all our social institutions and our understanding of human relationships. And we can think about many examples of this. I mean, I won't bore you by going th through it all because it's something that is easy enough to sort, sort of just dwell on for, for yourself. But to, ju just to take one or two examples, um, that how, how would you understand the idea of love from this point of view? That, that, uh, that um, Because love is something that you can't define in terms of an entitlement, which, you know, which is what a right is. I, mean, have a, I can't have a right to be loved. I mean, who is going to have the obligation to love me? And if somebody is under an obligation to love me, then they're not loving me at all, because love isn't the kind of thing that can be required by a legal obligation. And so if, if you think that all our social relationships must be understood in terms of rights, then the first cropper, if you like, will be love. Because you can't, to turn it into an entitlement is immediately to destroy it. Similarly, with forms of human relationship which in a sense are derived from love, if you like, or have some relationship to it, your an idea of benevolence or of altruism, that disappears if I, on the receiving end of altruism, believe that I have a right to your resources. Altruism disappears in the language of rights because I, as the poor person, am entitled to what you have, or some of what you have, as a rich person. So again, if we think that rights define properly all sorts of human relationships, then we've got this conundrum of how far it is that we can um, press that because asserting them as rights will actually destroy them. Benevolence, altruism, love, compassion, all of these would, would fall apart if we thought that a rights culture was, as it were, all there was to be said about the social morality of a liberal democratic society. So on this view, even if we think that the choice theory or the interest theory of rights is the most powerful and important one, it can still follow from that, that um, you, you have to have some kind of sanctioning, some kind of legitima legitimacy for practices and institutions and so forth that go beyond rights because they can't be made compatible with rights. But we don't say, well, these things are made incompatible with rights, so we've got to get rid of them, love and all the rest of it. But rather, we've got to preserve some kind of space for these important human attributes that you can't possibly reduce to ideas of rights and entitlement. And incidentally, while I'm just banging on about this, you could say exactly the same would be true of the alternative uh, point of view uh, to rights, which is very often that of uh, a kind of market uh, that, that uh, instead of being entitled to things through rights, you entitled to things because you can buy them. But as the Beatles said, you can't buy me love. Um, and, you know, buying love destroys love. So on, on this view, whichever way you come at it, there has to be a sphere of life which is neither market-driven nor a set of entitlements through rights, which has to 
be preserved because it's fundamental to social life that there is love, that there is relationship, that there is uh, compassion, that there is benevolence, that there is altruism and so forth, none of which can be made sense of in terms of a set of rights, whether of the choice or the interest of it. And of course, this is where the religious dimension can come in, not just as a, a kind of an alternative to the rights view, because you could still have a basic set of rights, but you've got to have some way of protecting and cultivating those human attributes and attitudes which are essential to social life, but which cannot be reduced to the law and to rights. Uh, and and we've, we've got to find some kind of a space for that. So in order to find the space for that, we have to sort of see the sphere of rights as one thing and a very important thing, a fundamental thing, but at the same time recognise that it's not all there is to social, to social life and not, not everything can be turned into rights in exactly the same way as not everything can be turned into matters of economic value. And of course, historically, it is faith communities, if you like, uh, that have uh, tended to um, want to both cultivate, nurture, and defend these ideas of social relationships which transcend both rights and markets. And that's, I think, a very important issue. But having said that, it's not that easy to sort of figure it all out in terms of a coherent social philosophy. Now, when you get the handout, you'll see towards the end uh, there are two or three passages that I quoted from a, a very interesting uh, Canadian uh, philosopher, Joan uh, Lockwood O'Donovan, uh, which is precisely on this issue about how if we had a society entirely based on rights um, and that exhausted sort of the resources of social morality, then we would find that, particularly on the choice theory of rights, we would find that all the things that we thought we could make collective judgments about turn into things that we have to make private judgments about and that it's very difficult to arrive at a, uh, a set of, um, a, 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 a set of, well, if you like, collective values. I don't mean by that in, in any sort of particularly partisan um, political sense, but there has to be some kind of preservation, even if it's only for the, the, the kind of common morality of building lighthouses or um, uh, protecting people through um, defence uh, mechanisms and so forth. There has to be some basis for collective action somewhere in society because you can't do it all through individual rights. And if that's so, then we need some other kind of recognition, sorry, the recognition of some other kind of social relations and social institutions. Um, and and uh, that, that's the message of her argument uh, towards the end of the uh, handout uh, paper. But there are still many questions that I've sort of got to address, but um, I think probably not not this afternoon, um, so, you know, could, could go on for another five minutes perhaps, but um, I think I'll leave it at that because it would you know, give some time for questions now, but it would also, um, I'd be starting something I want to make the focus of in the next session, so it would be a bit difficult to, uh, to, to sort of stop that uh, in a sort of an arbitrary way, so um, I think I'll finish on that. And, very happy to, you know, have questions and so forth. Yeah.